Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the session of cardiomyopathy. We have with us Dr. Abhijit Chatterjee, a clinical, non-visive, invasive person. He was earlier in Kolkata, has recently moved to Chittagong in Bangladesh. As you can see from his portfolio, to deal on this topic of cardiomyopathy, Dr. Abhijit is a very intelligent person. He has done his MD, DM cardiology along with diploma in cardiology, along with DNB cardiology. And the best part is he has got a lot of interest in non-visible. That is, I feel, the most important thing is to have a clinical diagnosis followed by non-visible and ultimately the invasive part to come to a conclusion of a case and to be a complete cardiologist. With this few words, let me hand over a mic to Dr. Abhijit to deal with this topic of cardiomyopathy. And at the end, we'll have question answer session. Dr. Abhijit, it's all yours. Thanks for those kind words, sir. The topic which I have got today, an overview. What is cardiomyopathy? Disease of diseases of cardiac muscle, which are not necessarily, they are a combination of one or more of the following. In a particular hypertrophy and or dilatation, systolic and dilatation and arrhythmias. Cardiomyopathies may be when the etiology is not known. For example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, left ventricular non-compaction, and it can be sent secondary <coughs> to infiltrated storage toxins, endocrine abnormalities, immune disorders, and chemotherapy. First of all, let's take the topic of dilated cardiomyopathy. Look at the heart on the left. It's a normal heart. Look at the picture on the right. It's that of dilated cardiomyopathy. What do you see? Four chambers of the heart are dilated. Left ventricle, left atrium. Right atrium. Now, if it is a disease generalized, why should one chamber be dilated? In fact, all the four chambers, the Dilatation usually starts with the left ventricle, gradually progresses to involve all the four chambers of the heart. More, that is four chamber enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy may or the valves are normal and the annuli are dilated. The importance of dilated annuli is that the tips of the Atrioventricular valve coapt properly, giving rise to mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Histopathology. This is the histopathology of cardiac muscle. And this is the histopathology of a patient who died of dilated. And in between the strands of cardiac myocytes, you find fibrous. Remember friends, fibrous tissue does not contract and this accounts for the poor contractility of the cardiac muscle in patients of dilated cardiomyopathy. Let us quickly go through the 2D characteristics of dilated cardiomyopathy. There is normal wall thickness, left ventricular hypertrophy, if at all, is very minimal. Secondly, there is four chamber dilatation, thirdly, the left ventricular shape is spherical instead of being elliptical. And lastly, there is poor systolic function giving rise to global hypokinesia and decreased ejection fraction and fractional shortening. Look at the picture on the left side. The left ventricle in a normal person is like a, is a prolate ellipsoid, more like a bullet. And here it approximates to the shape of a football, it's more rounded. The same thing in the picture on the right side. 
Look at this video clip. There is global hypokinesia, very poor LV systolic function. How much is the ejection fraction? Hardly 20 or 25%. Same patient, a picture taken from the parastandard long axis view. Very poor systolic function, very poor systolic technique. There is disto diminished systolic technique of the septum and the left ventricle. This is septum and this is left ventricular posterior wall. There is diminished systolic thickening of septum and posterior wall. M mode study, it shows that the E point septal separation is increased. The upper limit of normal is seven millimeters. Here, it is more than seven millimeters. There is reduced aortic dance and gradual closure of the aortic valve leaflets. What are the Doppler findings? There is increased EYA ratio, decreased isovolumic relaxation time and deceleration time. There is functional mitral and tricuspid regurgitation because of annular dilatation. The pulmonary venous diastolic wave is much bigger than the systolic wave. And tissue Doppler study shows decrease of the amplitude of all the waves. If you look at the color Doppler findings, this is there is tricuspid, so this is mitral regurgitation by an eccentric jet. You see the blue color, and after that, you see the red color. It is these are not two separate jets, but the same jet which is getting which is hitting the roof of the left atrium and getting reflected back into the left atrium. This is severe mitral regurgitation. Diastolic dysfunction progresses from grade one to four as the disease progresses. Tissue doctor findings show diminished amplitude of all the three waves. The million dollar question is whether this is idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy or ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. In ischemic cardiomyopathy, there is regional hypokinesis or akinesis. There is a presence of scar tissue. I'm going to show you in a picture. It is diagnosed by tissue doctor imaging, stress echo, coronary angiography, and cardiac MRI. Look at this echo. There is compensated, compensatory hypertrophy of the left ventricular posterior wall. But really what strikes you is the fact that the septum is thinned, scarred, and echinating. And because of the failure, there is some pericardial effusion posteriorly. This is the septum. Same patient, apical four chamber view, the ventricles are dilated and the septum is thinned, scarred, and echinating. The differential diagnosis includes ischemic cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, hypertension, inflammation, metabolic, systemic disorders, neuromuscular disorders, toxins, and pericard peripartum cardiomyopathy. Prognosis, these are the four prognostic factors, low left ventricular ejection fraction, left ventricular remodeling, characterized by a large left ventricular end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, increased LV mass, dilated left atrium, diastolic dysfunction, dyssynchrony, and myocardial ischemia, and viability. This is non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Here you see that the left ventricle <coughs> endocardium has got small bits. Between, between the small bits of myocardium, the blood flows in and comes out. It is a developmental anomaly which has a genetic basis, and this leads to dilated cardiomyopathy. Here you see a contrast echo, which shows the trabeculations of contrast, uh, non-compaction non cardiomyopathy. This is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. This patient used to come to me with recurrent arrhythmias and ultimately had sudden death. In those days, in 
2009, the AICTs were not available in India as they are now. This disease is characterized by fibrofatty replacement of the wall of the right atrium. See, this is shiny, and there is a low pressure tricuspid regurgitation, and the right ventricle is dilated. See, there is a low pressure tricuspid regurgitation here. TR. What is the role of the echocardiographer in the management of dilated cardiomyopathy? To follow up the natural history of the disease. Patients of dilated cardiomyopathy have got a variable natural history. Some of them progress inexorably towards their death. Others improve, stay stable for variable periods of time and may deteriorate later. So, it is important to follow the natural history of the disease. Secondly, to identify the patients with poor prognosis, to assess the patient for cardiac resynchronization therapy and assess the patient for AICD therapy. This is AICD, basically biventricular pacing. One lead is paced in the left ventricle to the coronary sinus. The other uh, lead is paced in the right ventricle and plus the atrium, right atrium is based. Next, we come to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The same old picture on the left side, it indicates a normal heart with a normal looking septum. This is a hypertrophic septum. <clears throat> if you compare this septum to the posterior wall, you find that the septum is thickened. There are other abnormalities of the mitral valve including long leaflets and abnormal papillary muscles. There are four morphological types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The first is reverse curvature, the second is neutral, the third is sigmoid septum, and the fourth is apical. Apical was initially described in the Japanese, but then you can find it here in India also. This is a plaque view of the mitral valve showing the systolic and anterior motion. This is the anterior mitral leaflet. This is the posterior mitral leaflet. And you see that the mitral leaflet curves upward here and hits the septum. Can you see that? Anterior mitral leaflet, the tip curves upward and hits the septum. It does not happen in a normal heart. Again, look at that. The mitral valve leaflets curve upwards and hit the septum is forming a, an appearance similar to the letter X in the English alphabet. Again, systolic anterior motion. Here, it is hitting the septum. <clears throat> M-mode study, the septum is thicker compared to the posterior wall and the ejection fraction very often is super normal. The M-mode characteristics in a normal person is this, and in a patient of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, shows systolic anterior motion. See, this is systole, and the mitral leaflet, instead of staying flat, it moves up, it makes a hump here. Again, systole, it moves and makes a hump and touches the septum. Systolic anterior motion. Mid-systolic closure of the aortic valve. See, this is a normal person a rectangular opening of the aortic valve. And here, there's a mid-systolic notch, which is characteristic of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. <coughs> Sorry. LV diastolic dysfunction, it progresses from grade one to higher grades. The LV outflow shows a dagger-shaped profile. See, this is a late-peaking dagger-shaped profile. Here also, late-peaking dagger shaped profile. Now, the question arises, why does systolic anterior motion occur? Systolic anterior motion occurs because of the Venturi effect. What is Venturi effect? Now, suppose you are standing on a railway platform. They ask you to not to go close to the platform when a fast moving train is coming. Why? Because the fast moving train sucks everything that are, lies around it. So here, the rapid 
outflow of blood through the narrowed left ventricular outflow tract sucks the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and gives rise to systolic anterior motion. Continuous of uh, pulse wave doctor of the LVOT shows a dagger shaped profile <coughs> before Valsalva it was 42, after Valsalva 60. Any gradient of more than 30 millimeters mercury is obstructive. Some textbooks like Otto put it at 50. A significant gradient is one that is equal to or more than 30 millimeters of mercury. If it is absent in the resting, but provoked by the Valsalva maneuver or amine nitride, it is called latent obstruction. We should not use inotropes because that gives rise to false results. The obstruction may not lie in the LVOT. It may be the mid cavity. So we have to scan the LV from the apex to the base with pulse wave Doppler to detect mid cavity obstruction. Any patient who has got systolic anterior motion will also have regurgitation of the mitral valve. It is because the mitral valve leaflets do not coag properly and there's a gap in between the two leaflets. <clears throat> if you have systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, but you're not getting my mitral regurgitation, then there is something wrong with your echo. Get back to your patient, do the echo again, and you will find mitral regurgitation. Apical HCM, the apical region of the LV is disproportionately taken. The other portions of the LV may not be taken. The hallmark of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is obliteration of the apical region of the LV during systole so that the remaining portion of the LV shows the appearance of an ace of spades. You can see the obliteration of the LV cavity during systole. For those of you who are not convinced with this picture, see the next picture. Can you see the obliteration of the LV cavity during systole. Just look at it. The LV cavity is becoming almost non-existent during systole in the apical region. What is the role of the echocardiographer in the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? To assess the effectiveness of medical therapy in reducing the LVOT gradient, you can give beta blockers, you can give calcium channel block blockers, and other agents which have got negative inotropic effect like disopyramide. Number two, assessment of the patient before and after alcohol septal ablation. Here, here it lies the role of the myocardial contrast echo. Assessment before, doing, during, and after surgical myectomy. If the interventricular septum thickness is more than 30 millimeters mercury, it predisposes the patient to malignant ventricular arrhythmias. Herein lies the role of the AICD. The detection of latent disease in the first degree relatives of the probiotic patient. <coughs> Sorry. What are the echo markers of poor prognosis? Massive left ventricular hypertrophy, characterized by wall thickness of more than 30 millimeters, especially in young patients. Left ventricular apical aneurysm combined with localized myocardial scarring and a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Number three, end stage disease that is associated with poor systolic function. Number four, large transmural infarction caused by alcohol septal ablation. It is important to realize that <clears throat> although the left ventricular outflow tract gradient predicts heart failure and death, it is a poor mar marker for prognosis. The differential di diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy includes hypertensive heart disease, valvular heart disease, infants born of diabetic mothers, tumors invading the interventricular septum, and patients undergoing hemodialysis. This is a patient who has got calcific aortic stenosis, and this is very easily confused with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because the ECG shows 
left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern characterized by ST segment depression and T inversion similar to that found in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <coughs> Again, there is a systolic murmur in the aortic area, which is sometimes confused with a murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But here I did the echo from various windows, and this was from the right parasternal window that I got a maximum pressure gradient of 157 millimeters mercury and a mean pressure gradient of 80 millimeters mercury. This is a sigmoid septum. Can you see this, this part? It looks like an S, sigma. So this is found in various elderly persons, such as those uh, with hypertension and diabetes. The measurement of the LV should not be taken at this level, but you should take a little more distal so that you don't get false results. One important role of the echocardiographer is to distinguish hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from the athlete's art. These are the characteristics of the athlete's art. The left ventricular wall thickness less than 14 millimeters, genetic testing shows genetic abnormalities, family study of the other members shows similar morphologic abnormalities, pulse wave doctor of the mitral valve shows diastolic dysfunction, the E prime uh, of the athlete's heart shows uh, more than seven millimeters in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's less than seven millimeters. The athlete's heart has got dilated LV cavity and for the athletes, there is a regression of left ventricular hypertrophy following four to six weeks of deconditioning. This is the ultrastructure of the cardiac muscle and it shows the various sites at which mutations can occur and give rise to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may be medical, may be surgical and interventional. What you do in interventional uh, treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you inject absolute alcohol into the first septal branch of the LAD. So here they are injecting alcohol in the first septal branch and here you can see the thickened septum has be become less thickened, it is more thin and the obstruction is relieved to a great extent. Here you see the gradient between the aorta and left ventricle has become reduced. And finally, we come to the topic of restrictive cardiomyopathy. What is restrictive cardiomyopathy? It is characterized by increased stiffness of the ventricular walls. There is heart failure because of impaired ventricular filling. The systolic function is initially normal, but becomes progressively impaired. These are the hallmarks of restrictive cardiomyopathy. By atrial enlargement, there is good ventricular systolic function, at least in the initial stages, and there is restrictive filling pattern. These are some examples of infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Amyloid, iron overload from multiple transfusions, hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, and glycogen storage disorder. What is cardiac amyloidosis? There is brilliant white appearance of the myocardium and valves. There are features of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Incompetent valves and pericardial effusion may be present. Systolic function is preserved, at least in the initial stages. This is a patient who was a 28-year-old IT engineer. <clears throat> he has got biatrial enlargement and small ventricles with good systolic function. He also had a pacemaker wire in the right ventricle. Conduction abnormalities are very common, and he died of intractable ascites. Here you see that the left ventricular systolic function is very good, and there is a pericardial effusion because of the diastolic failure. The deceleration time is barely 121 milliseconds, which shows that the prognosis is poor. The TDI of the septal annulus 
shows decreased systolic velocity and decreased early diastolic velocity. The management of cardiac amyloidosis should stress on the relief of symptoms and prevent further amyloid deposition. We can use loop diuretics, but not ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or calcium channel blockers. There should be anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. AL amyloidosis can respond to chemotherapy similar to that of myeloma, and ATTR amyloidosis responds well to liver transplant if you do it early enough. Endomyocardial fibrosis is found in areas close to, a, to the equator. In India, it used to be very common in Kerala. Fortunately, it is less common now. Here, you can see the biatrial enlargement, good LV systolic function, dilated inferior vena cava, dilated hepatic veins, and there is no respiratory variation in the mitral inflow. Here was a patient from West Bengal who had endomyocardial fibrosis proved by cardiac MRI. There is severe mitral regurgitation because of involvement of the mitral valve apparatus by the fibrosis and thrombus that occupies the LV apex. There is tricuspid regurgitation. Another picture showing mitral regurgitation. The deceleration time is barely about 128 milliseconds, which shows that the prognosis is poor. And the IVC is dilated, and there is hardly any change with respiration. The, there is pulmonary arterial hypertension in endomyocardial fibrosis, and the this tricuspid regurgitation gradient is about 58 millimeters mercury. If you add about 12, then the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is about 70, which is very high. Thank you.